good morning to all the faculty members and the delegates my name is dr sanjana punja i'm a third year radiology resident currently studying in krishna institute of medical sciences karad maharashtra uh, the topic for my paper presentation is orbital lesions so the aim and objective of my uh, paper is to establish the role of mr imaging in pre treatment evaluation of orbital lesion materials and methods used uh, is that the, it's a study institution based perspective type of descript descriptive study uh, done using a siemens 1.5 tesla mri machine with a sample size of 12 patients in the department of radio diagnosis krishna institute of medical sciences karad the data was collected from august 2020 to uh, june 2022 and the inclusion criteria being patients with suspected orbital lesions now introduction single muscle enlargement is suggestive of idiopathic orbital myositis when it is associated with acute onset of marked orbital pain particularly on eye movement and often with a mild prodromal ache the days before with typical presenting symptoms and signs an immediate trial of high dose corticosteroids without prior biopsy is warranted where pain is absent and with less acute presentation malignant causes such as lymphoma and metastasis metastasis becomes more likely metastatic malignancies tend to affect the lateral rectus most commonly and that is because of uh, the comparatively rich additional blood supply from the lac lacrimal artery being larger than arteries to the other um, extraocular muscles or as in leukemia because of the greater bone marrow density in the neighboring greater wing of sphenoid as well as zygoma now in thyroid eye disease isolated single muscle involvement is rare and in practical terms never affects the lateral rectus superior rectus or oblique muscles in isolation Lacrimal gland masses can be classified into two broad groups: that is, inflammatory and neoplastic, either lymphoma or salivary gland type tumors. Now, cavernous malformations are the most commonly common primary tumors of the orbit. So, my first case is a patient of Graves uh, having gave Graves of thymopathy. The patient presented with uh, proptosis. There was no trace of Graves disease. So here we can see that there is a uh, enlargement of the extra ocular uh, muscles the inferior rectus medial rectus and the superior rectus muscles bilateral symmetrical enlargement of these on t1 coronal the extra ocular muscles appear iso intense on t2 axial images here we can see that the extra ocular muscles appear relatively hyper intense and there is a sparing of the tendinous insertion which is one point which differentiates uh, which uh, would differentiate uh, it from uh, um uh, orbital uh, pseudo tumor where the tendinous insertion also would be involved on t2 coronal imaging we can see here that there is crowding of the extra ocular muscles at the apex um in on t1 fat sat post contrast coronal images here we can see that the extra ocular muscles are showing peripheral post contrast enhancement and there is no suppression on fat sat fat sat seen within the extra ocular muscles however we can see that in the uh, regions around the uh, extra ocular muscles that is the orbital uh, fat uh, containing uh, uh, areas are showing uh, uh, suppression on fat sat <clears throat> now in general the imaging features for graves of thymopathy uh, are um, exophthalmos extra ocular muscle enlargement and fatty attenuation uh, within the orbit characteristic order of muscle involvement can be remembered by the mnemonic i am slow so as it uh, involves firstly the uh, inferior rectus and the medial rectus superior rectus that like rectus uh, muscles in that order and the involvement is usually bilateral and symmetrical which is which is a typical uh, presentation anterior tendon is typically spared although it can be involved in acute cases with the swelling largely confined to the muscle belly therefore it gives this coke bottle kind of appearance that we can see over here <clears throat> my next case is um, was a patient who had a history of renal cell uh, carcinoma a 50 uh, 54 year old male who came with the complaints of um, diplopia so mr imaging was done and uh, we could see a lobulated fusiform altered signal intensity mass lesion involving the superior rectus and the levator palpebral superioris so t2 coronal image um, on uh, right here we can see that there is a heterogeneously hypoiso intense mass which is showing some uh, amount of patchy diffusion restriction uh, as well as heterogeneous post contrast uh, enhancement is noted so this was a case which was data proven to be um, 
case of extraocular uh, muscle metastasis. Now, spread to the orbit is secondly to hematogenous spread of primary tumor. So now the most common primary cancers with uh, metastasized to the orbit are breast, lung, and prostate. Well encapsulated, discrete, and focal intraconal masses are unlikely to be metastatic, while masses which involve the extraocular muscles and bone are much more likely to be metastasis. A tumor pattern can vary from diffuse infiltrative to a focal mass. However, one point to note is that metastasis from carcinoid uh, tumors or neuroendocrine tumors, uh, renal cell carcinoma and melanoma, they tend to be circums uh, circumscribed as uh, seen in our, uh, in our case. Now, all orbital metastases should show some amount of enhancement with contrast on MR imaging. Now, uh, my next case was an intraocular uh, squamous cell carcinoma, again, bi biopsy proven case. So, the patient presented, uh, it was a 70 uh, year old female who presented uh, with an ocular lesion since the past six years. And she came primarily with the complaint of watering um, of her. Um, right eye since uh, one month and loss of vision in that same eye uh, since the past four years. On imaging, uh, what we saw is a well-defined lobulated altered signal intensity mass lesion in the right intraocular compartment, uh, replacing uh, almost the entire of the globe along with rupture of the globe. So on T1 axial uh, images, uh, the mass lesion appeared iso-intense. On T2 coronal, it was heterogeneously hyper-intense. On post-contrast, T1 fat side post-contrast, there was heterogeneous post-contrast enhancement. And on stir uh, coronal, you can see that it is heterogeneously hyper-intense. Here we can see a um, structure, linear, the structure which is, uh, which is appearing hypo on all sequences. So that is a part of the margin of the globe which has ruptured. So squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva is an uncommon tumor that arises either de novo or from a prior conjunctival or corneal intraepithelial neoplasm. A typical presentation is a slow-growing mass involving the limbus in the elderly with a complaint of ocular irritation or redness. So most commonly, uh, squamous cell carcinoma would involve the eyelids or, or the limbus region, the conjunctiva. And intraocular invasion of, uh, it is generally rare, is a rare condition as seen in this case. My next uh, case is Toloza Hunt uh, syndrome. So idiopathic inflammatory granulomatous process uh, involving the cavernous sinus with possible extension into the superior vital cushion or vital apex. The inflammation causes extrinsic compression of the neurovascular structures that can cross the cavernous sinus. Now, clinically, the patient would present uh, with relapsing unilateral painful ophthalmoplegia, which is responsive to steroid therapy. Gadolinium enhanced MRI is the imaging modality of choice to evaluate uh, toloza hunt syndrome and may demonstrate abnormal enlargement and enhancement of the cavernous sinus extending through the superior orbital fissure and into the orbital apex. Reported MRI findings on T1 and T2 uh, weighted images are extremely variable and quite non-specific. Now, MRI will plays a pivotal role in diagnosing and helps to exclude other common lesions involving the cavernous sinus, avoiding the need for high-risk invasive procedures such as a biopsy, the only way to obtain the histopathological confirmation of the disease. So now this patient presented actually with a unilateral headache, um, ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. Um, so here what we could see it was that there was an uh, altered signal intensity lesion which was seen in the orbital uh, apex, uh, superior orbital fissure and extending into the cavernous sinus. Uh, and over here, we can also see that there is uh, so there is adjacent meningeal uh, and ural enhancement seen along the anterior temporal lobe. So on T2 fat side images, uh, it was appearing hypo intense and iso intense on T1 fat sat uh, images. T1 fat sat post contrast showed uh, contrast uh, post contrast avid enhancement. Um, Extending into the dura, uh, extending into the adjacent dura as well as meninges. So here we can also see that on T2 uh, fat side coronal images, there is involvement of the superior vital fissure and the cavernous sinuses. And you can see here that there is a narrowing of the left uh, internal carotid artery as well. 
So my next case is a biopsy proven case of sebaceous carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. This patient presented with swelling in the right eye uh, since the past two months. And what we could see was a well-defined soft tissue uh, lesion seen in the lateral extragonal compartment of the right orbit. On uh, T2, it appeared uh, showing about an intermediate signal intensity. Now this lesion is uh, kind of pushing the uh, lateral aspect of the eyeball medially, indicating that it is a firm mass. On T1 axial, it again appeared about intermediate to low, um, showing uh, low signal intensity. And on T1 uh, fat side uh, pre-contrast coronal, it was appearing hyper intense, not showing fat suppression. And on T1 uh, fat side post-contrast images, it was uh, it was showing heterogeneous uh, post-contrast enhancement. Now, sebaceous carcinoma usually arises from the periovital uh, area, especially the eyelids, but primary um, sebaceous carcinoma of the lacrimal glands is extremely rare. Sebaceous carcinoma of the orbit is usually caused by ovital invasion of the periovital carcinoma or by METs of uh, tumors from other parts of the body. To establish a differential diagnosis, a systemic examination of the uh, eyelids and conjunctiva is therefore essential. My next case is of a cavernous, uh, so it's a case of uh, cavernous uh, venous uh, malformation. So this patient presented with uh, swelling in the right eye since two months. So what we could see is that in the intracoronal compartment, there was a well-defined lesion um, in the right orbit and that was leading to proptosis. So on T2 uh, axial images, it's appearing um, hyper intense with multiple flow voids are noted. Again, on stir uh, coronal images, it's appearing hyper intense with uh, multiple flow voids within. On T1 axial, it is ISO to uh, the other uh, as compared to the extraocular muscles. And on T1, F, uh, T1 fat sat uh, uh, post contrast images, it is showing avid post contrast enhancement. Now, cavernous venous malform malformations of the orbit, uh, which are formerly known as orbital cavernous hemangiomas are the most common primary orbital lesions of adults. They are non-neoplastic, slow-flow uh, venous malformations. Now, cavernous venous uh, malformations are typically located in the intracoronal space, as we can see in this case. They are usually septate and well-circumscribed and may exhibit progressive enhancement on delayed images, and they do not interview. So, my next case is a case of a multi-compartmental orbital lymphoma. This patient presented with swelling in the right eye again since two, two months. What we saw is that there was on MR imaging uh, mildly enlarged bilateral lac lacrimal glands, uh, the left being more bulky than the right one, with diffuse enlargement of the left uh, lateral rectus and along with involvement of its tenderness insertion uh, as well. So on uh, T1 uh, fat side images, it appeared iso to hypo intense. On T1 uh, fat side post contrast images, the lateral rectus uh, and the um, lacrimal gland shows intense homogeneous enhancement, and the uh, retrobulbar uh, intraorbital segment of the le left optic uh, nerve is showing a peripheral kind of uh, rim of enhancement, suggestive of perineuritis. <clears throat> So again, here we can see on T1 uh, fat side post contrast images showing intense homogeneous uh, enhancement. In the next image, we can see uh, how we've measured uh, the proptosis as there was 27 um, mm uh, distance that was seen. So left eyeball proptosis was seen. As well as you can note in this image that the left lateral rectus is involved along with its tenderness insertion. Now, uh, one uh, characteristic feature of a vital lymphoma uh, is that it has a tendency to involve superior and lateral uh, extraocular muscles more than the inferior and medial ones. Now, vital lymphomas account for only 2% of all lymphomas, but approximately 50% of all primary or vital malignancies in adults. Now, on imaging, the mass may be with distinct margins, which shows an iso-intense signal on T1 and iso to hyper intense on T2, showing variable um, kind of post-contrast enhancement. Now, um, one way that the majority of the cases uh, that we have seen uh, were involving the extraocular muscles. Uh, so if we were to make uh, an algorithm uh, re related to the extraocular muscle enlargement, uh, this is one uh, way we could do it. 
is that first we rule out thyroid eye disease, which would be the most common cause for extraocular muscle enlargement. If that is not the case, then we think of other culprits. So we look at the history. So if it's a known case of malignancy, then we screen for metastasis. Uh, if there are features of idiopathic or vital myositis, uh, like this involvement of the tendinous insertions, um, as we discussed earlier, then we give a trial of steroids and see how it responds to that, as this condition would respond uh, very well to steroids. And if all of these things um, are not fitting, then uh, the last step that we would go for is muscle biopsy. So looking at the statistics, uh, I've taken uh, seven uh, orbital uh, lesions. So one, uh, the first one was a thyroid of thermopathy and I had two cases of those. Uh, one case of orbital metastasis, two cases of toloza hunt syndrome, two cases of orbital squamous cell carcinoma, one case of sebaceous carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, two, uh, two cases of cavernous, uh, cavernous venous uh, malformations, and two cases of orbital lymphoma. Represented again in this uh, pie chart. So the conclusion um, uh, for my study was that we, I took 12 cases uh, that were followed and segregated according to the uh, MR findings. And orbital lesions form a wide range of pathologies that create challenges in diagnosis, management, and treatment. The high resolution soft tissue detail provided by uh, MRI has allowed for better lesion characterization. And especially in cases where the history and clinical evaluation are insufficient, MRI plays a crucial role. MRI is also important in the detection uh, of the extent of orbital diseases. So these were the references that I've uh, used uh, for my paper. Thank you.